Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. We have Hannah Otto with us today and our CEO, Nate Pearson. Today, we're going to talk about runner's high, but on the cycling perspective, and I dove into some research on this and I was actually very surprised. I had it completely wrong. I misunderstood it. Uh, that will be fun to look into. Uh, we're also going to talk about racing FOMO uh, that we may have early season <laughs> and uh, may or may not, who knows? And then also power to weight race. It's going to be good stuff. So right now, if people are listening to this, Nate's uh, red light, green light, it's an early access. Uh, do you want to, I've, I've done like a whole lot of thinking and outlining on the marketing side of things recently. And it's been really fun to like think about this feature and stuff. And it's also been really cool to see the feedback from the athletes. Do you want to explain it really quick and encourage people to sign up uh, so they can go yeah. or, or enable it, I should say? What it is, it's it's an ability, it's a, it's a brand new thing that no one's done before that is designed to pre- prevent you from getting burned out. So it predicts fatigue before it happens and adjusts your training to get you on track. So it's different than just saying you're tired today. What it's saying is if you do this workout today, if you do this intensity work today, you're going to be tired in the future. There's a big difference between those two things. A lot of people say, if you're tired today, don't train, which is one thing. But saying that it's going to hit you later down the road, which is the one that always gets us. It's that day where you're like, I, I could work out, but should I? And that's the thing that always like, I think a lot of us say, yes, I'm going to work out. And then we can dig ourselves into a hole and then things get bad. <laughs> Not um, me. <laughs> Never. Yeah. So it, basically what it does is it gives you, you know, regular adaptive training gives you training, uh, gives the workout every day. Or if you just train without even using that product, you could just train outdoors, but then the product will give you a yellow or red day on days that we think that are, um, that will be beneficial to change. So yellow day would be, uh, we'd give you an endurance day rather than some kind of intensity. And a red day would be assigned rest, which is going to be new too. So the cool thing about this product is you could use just train outside. You just do like Zwift races and outside riding and still get yellow and red days based on your uh, performance. Mm -hmm. And no need to actually use a trainer or training plan. But if you do use a training plan, what really happens a lot is people say, hey, how do I I fold in my outside uh, group rides and stuff like that into my training? And this will give you the ability to like, this will tell you how to change your training automatically when these things happen. You have to do anything besides under early access, there's a button, um, it's on the website, under your profile, there's an early access thing and you can enable it. And it'll be out shortly after this podcast launches. It should be unless there's a bug. Um, hopefully a few days, on most a month, but hopefully a few days. So yeah, that's it's super, really cool. Um, the other thing that is a big question that people get and that I want to answer right now mm. is someone goes, you know, I did a really big ride on, let's say Wednesday, and now my Thursday workout is endurance, but that was an intensity workout and I want to do that one still. So can I just like switch things around on my training plan? And what happens is like you've, you've ridden like a, 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 you've taken a loan out on your body, right? And you need to pay that back and you can only do so many intense workouts per week. And you could shift that Thursday workout to Friday, but then Saturday is going to be impacted. And then Saturday, you have to switch to Sunday, you know, and then your whole week just starts getting it. And basically, if you do that bigger, if you do that bigger group ride or that long outside, even endurance ride, that is a air quotes, big ride, you, you, you have to take something else from your plan. You can't do it all. And if you do, you're going to start getting burnt out. And that's what we see when people say, you know, a trainer would burnt me out. They're not doing the plan. They're doing the plan plus other big, huge rides on top of it, like literally three to four hour outdoor rides. And then they do intervals and you back those up. I mean, you can, you could do those a couple few times and you keep doing them. You're going to burn out. It's not going to work out. Yeah. Um, no one can do that. So that's the, that's, that's one of the questions that happens. And it, it's like saying, you know, I spent a lot of money at the mall, but can I just like keep spending money? Like you gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta save a little bit on a few days to get the repay that credit card. So your mm-hmm. balance gets back to zero. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. It's a super, it's an awesome feature. I am excited for all of you to use it. If you have been wondering if you should sign up for Trainer Road, now's the time. The value that this feature delivers with the with adaptive training is insane. Uh, it's so good. So uh, go check it out. TrainerRoad.com. Go wait, sign up. Wait, wait. Yeah. It's too, summer's coming up and it, just using it only in the summer, just preventing like one burnout session in the whole summer is probably worth the money. Like if you burnt out, that's what I always think about. If you did get burnt out and you missed a whole bunch of weeks, would you pay like 20 bucks to prevent that? Yes. Probably, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, totally for all would. the work that you do and then like how far that puts you back in your training and all the money you spend on racing and bikes and all this sort of stuff and to get that extra 10 watts, uh, that's how we see it. So it should be, hopefully it's a really big value add for everybody. Yeah, and on I top think of everything else we get. 
that's a really good point that you brought up, Nate, because this is something unprecedented. It's 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 not a readiness score. It's the next generation of fatigue management, and it's looking ahead down the road and predicting it before it happens. And that's something that's something unprecedented. That's that that's why we you know the power of MLAI and everything else that we do. It all comes together to deliver this sort of cool thing for an athlete. And this is why you don't even have to follow a training plan. Like Nate said, you could just be riding outside. Let's say you've got, you know, whatever it is, a state championship race or something else that you are, and you're not following a training plan, but you still just want to do that race going into it. This would really be helpful in making sure that you aren't coming into that race red. Cause a lot of us as a race nears, we go shoot cram time. I need to get as much training in as I can. And we just push ourselves into yellow and red days when really we want to be far away from those when we come into that, that goal event. So it's like, uh, there's so many uses for it and it's amazing. It's amazing. So, yeah. I, I want to say two more answer, two more questions is one is what happens if I train on a yellow day? Cause yellow day is supposed to be an endurance day and a yellow day means, uh, it's not as bad as a red day, but still like caution. You can train on a yellow day. You're just going to have to rest afterwards. And something that happens where, um, we actually look at Hannah's career and she likes to go like three yellow days in a row. She keeps it yellow and then she takes like it goes like easy for like three or four days in a row. Mm -hmm. And she just naturally does that in her career. Uh, Hannah, I'm, I'm probably not like releasing any secrets. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, you're good. Cut that out. Okay. Um, but she likes to kind of like keep it yellow. She doesn't go into the red at all. And then she actually has the time to recover afterwards, which is really neat to see that like a different use case. Um, and that wasn't even, you know, we don't design that use case in, into the product, but it just happened that you could see it inside her own data. Um, and that's then very really few, point, Nate. sorry, yeah. one thing, that's a super good point. It's not like we were like, here are our training plans and now red light, green light, learn our training plans. And if you don't follow our training plan, it's going to give you yellow or red. That's not how it works yeah. at all. That's a really good point to bring up. Yeah. And then the red days, uh, Hannah, you had very, very few red days. I think it was like a bike packing trip where you went like 12,000 <laughs> miles in a weekend or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it shows that the consistency and the amount of volume you have and that you don't actually push yourself to those. Like when, you're, when you have big days, they're not so far outside of what you're doing and you have enough recovery going into them that they don't mess up your training. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I think it just, you have to build up to a certain amount. And if you're building at an appropriate rate, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're building at an appropriate rate, you're going to stay green or yellow. Those red days are going to come when you're accelerating at a pace that is unsustainable to maintain. Yep, yeah. that's right. And someone could also ride on a red day, but then you're just really going to have to pay. You're going to really have to rest later. And like uh, Leadville, that's a red day for me, right? And I also <laughs> had some other like, just like fun outside rides that I really liked that were red. I had a, a team camp where, you know, the first it was it was like green, yellow, yellow, red, red, or something like that. And I wanted to do the team camp and I knew I was going to take like a week or week and a half afterwards rest. And that's fine too. Um, it's just, if you train on the, one of those days, it's not going to necessarily destroy you on training a red day, but you have to rest. It will destroy you if you keep doing it over and over and over again. And you keep having red days and you keep pushing through it. And I think we probably have all done this thinking that we're trying to hit a certain TSS number of hours. Um, <laughs> And that, that's no good. Stop, Nate. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Stop outing me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's so exciting. I can't wait. Also, some people might be asking, why don't I see any green days on the calendar? Um, green is the default status. That's just where you'll normally be when you're going through training and everything's going well. That's yeah. just what it is. So if we don't show anything, you can train the way it is. Exactly right. Or wherever you want. Yeah. It's exciting stuff. Uh, okay, this question is from Mary, and I feel like I'm really curious to get your take on this, Hannah, in particular here. Uh, but before we go any further... I went through and I actually realized that I missed this. Mary, you submitted this question a few months or I guess a month and a half ago, I think. Uh, this is was our, for, by all my calculations, this is our 20,000th question that's been submitted to this podcast. 20,000 questions. Isn't that astounding, Nate? Like thinking about all that. So uh, pretty amazing. Thank you all for listening. Uh, we're This is episode 465. We're getting close to episode 500. I want your ideas down below. You should chime in on the comments right now and tell us what we should do for episode 500. Uh, something special to honor that sort of occasion. That's a pretty amazing thing. I can't believe that we're almost to that point. So let us know what we should do. Maybe we should get uh, Jonas on there. Maybe Lance. I don't know. Go, uh, go wild. Whatever you want to see. Let us know. 
Mary's question. She says, my name is Mary and I'm an avid listener to your podcast, which has been my go-to for over a year, especially during my long endurance rides as a professional cross country mountain biker and the current runner up in the league category in Guatemala. I'm reaching out for some expert advice on race day nutrition. First of all, congrats, Mary. Uh, super cool. Uh, to see your success. That's great. Uh, Mary says, I've hit a wall with pre-race meals. Nothing seems to sit right from smoothies and granola with milk to rice with honey. I just can't manage to eat it. The only thing my stomach will tolerate is cereal. And we're not talking about the healthy kind. I'm talking about sugary options like sh like Lucky Charms. Yeah. I'm, aware <laughs> yeah. I'm aware it's not the ideal meal before a race, but if Why that's not? all I can stomach, would it be an acceptable compromise? I'm keen to, keen to hear your thoughts on this and any suggestions you might have. Uh, thank you for your time and the valuable insights you prov or your podcast provides best from Mary, uh, they, you, <laughs> so, I hear so, nothing wrong with this, but go ahead, you two. Like, I'm I mean, so glad there was the pause because I was just holding back my laughter from this Nate's is, response. <laughs> I mean, this is, I, well, I, do you guys want to go first? You were a lot of stuff, so but I can, yeah, go, Hannah, why didn't what, what's your reaction to this? Because I assume that you haven't been able to control your breakfast perfectly when you've been racing all over the place in Greece and Switzerland and, and down at La Ruta, all over the place. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm curious what sh what they mean by hitting a wall. Um, is this just a it upsets your stomach? Like, are you is it stomach pain? Are you throwing up? Is it a texture thing? Is it I don't want to eat? I can't put it down. Like, I mean, we've all been there in the morning, right? We were kind of like gagging as you're trying. Is it that kind of thing? You know, because. I think all of those, depending on what it is, would depend on what ideas I give. Like, are we trying to make it more delicious or are we trying to make it not come up two hours later in the race? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I I think this is a longer conversation where we all are going to kind of go back and forth. But I think my very initial thought is if Lucky Charms work for you, from a from a nutrient standpoint before a race, I don't see an issue. The biggest thing is you're probably going to have to eat a lot of it. Um, like just a standard bowl of Lucky Charms. I'll, I'll let you go into that, Jonathan, because you sort of outlined it all. But it's not going to be enough. Um, like before these cross-country mountain bike races, you're probably aiming to eat anywhere from one to four grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight that you weigh, um, which is still a really big range, but you're not even hitting that one, most likely. And so you just need to make sure if you're going to go this route, you got to fully commit and you got to like channel Nate and eat like a massive bowl of it. <laughs> yeah, because I'm looking at this right now. I'll break down the so this is Three quarters of a cup of Lucky Charms, which I think is a serving from what I could tell. Um, no one eats that, though. <laughs> I'm just going to say my serving is a box. I don't know about all of you. But no, like, but I mean, <laughs> even just a bowl has got to be two to two and a half times that. Yeah, like exactly. Easy. So let's look at it in terms of a serving and then let's apply reality's lens to it after that. And let's just – and also I – I don't know if I'm going to trigger somebody here, but I chose to add in three quarters of a cup of skim milk is the, is the measurement. I know some people are like, do not number one, skim milk. I added that because you probably don't want to add a lot of fat before the morning of the race, right? Like you want to minimize that because it would slow digestion. That's why skim. But I, I don't know if you're uh put in a lot of milk with your cereal, cereal person or not a lot of milk with your cereal person, but, um, hopefully I didn't upset you by matching even, uh, calories with that. You're going to get 193 calories. You're going to get 1.7 grams of fat, so not a lot. You're going to get, uh, for sodium, 272 milligrams. So that's actually beneficial, right? Um, getting some sodium there. Uh, total carbs, only 34 grams to Hannah's point. Uh, if you're somewhere around like 55 grams of, uh, or 55 kilos or 50 to like 70 kilos, somewhere around there, that gives you an idea. You want to be somewhere around 1.4. Uh, so that's going to be pretty tough to be hitting that with cereal. You'll be eating a lot of it, or maybe it's really easy. It depends. Uh, you only get two grams of fiber, which I guess I say only it's still some, uh, and it's still something to, to keep in mind, but it's less than something like oatmeal. Uh, so I look at this and then it also has like, uh, protein in there, which really it, that's just going to slow digestion beforehand, but it's also not like a big deal going into it. But in some respects, lucky charms is better than oatmeal. 
uh, when you look at it just like straight across. And if you look at like portions and serving sizes, it's actually not too bad. I know everyone says oatmeal is quote healthy and good to have, but it's, it's very different. So I honestly don't think it's the worst meal, Nate. Like, uh, it like don't feel bad for eating Lucky Charms if it's something that you can get down, and if you can get down the right amount. It, it's not. It's like the best meal. You want low fiber, <laughs> yeah, palatable, uh, and uh, low fat, and so processed cereals. Like you don't want it other times bad. Mm-hmm. Before the race morning, good, and you can take it in your car. You could put pack it in your suitcase. Like it's the best meal, um, especially if you really like it and just take the guilt out of it. So what one cup is 30 grams, right? Of carbs. Yes. Uh, so easy two cups. She can eat two cups. <laughs> For sure. I guess she's a pro cross country uh, wow. mountain bike racer. She's relatively small, right? Like, yeah, she's not my size. She's not 200 pounds probably to be a pro. And, uh, so what she can have maybe three cups of that yeah. over the morning and that gets you to 90 grams. And wh- how, what are we shooting for? How much are we shooting for for her to start before? 1.4 is what you said, Hannah, is like what you said. I said like one, two, four. Oh, one, two, one four. four. Forgive me. One, two, four. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 I've yeah. tried three in the morning, but let's say she's 50 kilograms or something, three. So that's going to get her to, three would get her to like 90 grams. So she would need about 60 more and she could just drink some juice. Yeah. And she's there. And you got to make sure the juice doesn't destroy your stomach though, but you could do. That's a pretty big breakfast, so three cups of that. But it's so easy to eat. Lucky Charms, it's like airy and Mm -hmm. uh, delicious. Especially (laughs) if you don't eat it all the time, right? If you just eat it once in a while for a pre treat and then drink whatever juice you like the best, you could get that easy. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I do think the key is being aware of that. Like, I do think it's very possible. What'd you say? Three cups? It's probably very possible for them to eat three cups of this cereal. But it probably wouldn't be the natural go to, you know, if I, personally, if I'm pouring yeah. cereal, I wouldn't automatically pour three cups. So the awareness of knowing this is how I need to consume more of this than I think I do is probably the key here. And yeah. if you do that all from like you're not used to consuming three cups of that, then you put three cups of it into your gut on race morning. That's like something if you're not used to that, that is likely probably to cause some gut distress. Mm-hmm. Two with the uh, what she's eating before smoothies. Smoothies, I'm thinking mm-hmm. fiber, right? Fruit has so much fiber mm-hmm. in it, and that can really sit in your stomach and mess it up too when you're going really hard. Granola, granola is full of fiber. It's like oatmeal and nuts, mm-hmm. and nuts have fat too. That's also going to be like granola, depending on what you buy. But a lot of U.S. granola too is always kind of like a lower carb option. It's hard to find a high, higher carb granola. Um, you're probably getting a lot of your calories from uh, fat in that time from the nuts. Um, or they'll put like some type of uh, oil in it too. And rice and honey, that just sounds disgusting. Like <laughs> eat the, <laughs> have the cereal. Um, uh, another option is you do two different cereals. You switch between like, uh, mm, what's it called? Fun. Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Lucky Charms. And you have a little bowl of each. Yeah. And I, that's really cool. I did think something really basic too of maybe a lesser amount of the cereal and then white bread with honey. Like adding that extra thing in, it's so simple. I can't imagine it causing an issue. I don't know, but that wasn't something that you listed as something you tried, like white bread um, or pancakes, you know, douse it with syrup, douse it with honey, make it super delicious. And like Nate said, the juice also on the side, like these are really easy ways to add in those extra carbs as well. Yeah, I I personally like my go-to and i think hannah i've heard you say that like you had during um uh, your recent stage race did you what was your breakfast that you typically had was it rice and eggs no that was my lunch i always do pancakes for breakfast pancakes yeah. for breakfast yeah uh rice and eggs i put that down just out of curiosity because that's like the one that i do before a race um i get so much sweet like in terms of the drink that i'll be sipping on and everything else i like to have my breakfast be more on the savory side but I put this down. A lot of people I see put in a lot of egg and I put, I usually do a very small amount of egg in my pre-race one because it's really, and also if you just do egg whites, that can really help in cutting down the fat. Um, but 
it's really easy to get a lot of fat when you do white rice, like a, a cup of white rice and two eggs. That'll give you 740 to, to 800 calories, but it gives you 11 grams of fat. If you compare that back to the cereal, that cereal is going to have 1.7 grams of fat. If we're looking at the sort of proportions that we're dealing with, it's probably going to be around four, maybe. Um, so way less than what you're dealing with here. Um, but then you get like not a whole lot of difference in terms of the sodium fiber. It's actually pretty darn low in fiber, uh, but man, you sure get a whole lot of carbohydrate with that. So if you are doing the rice and eggs thing, which I know is really common, just make sure that you aren't putting in too much egg or something else. Cause then it might give you bubble guts and slow down digestion and everything else coming into that race. Cause eggs have a lot of fat, um, and it adds up really fast. So, well, and on that note, it sounds like it sounds like Mary is a sweet breakfast person based on the Lucky Charms, but <laughs> for anyone else who's listening, I think we get really caught up, especially in um, this sweet style of breakfast, especially at least in the U.S. we do. Here's a reminder that there's no one way that breakfast has to be eaten. If you want to eat pasta before the race, that's 100% acceptable um, and a great option as well. So try and expand, especially on race morning, your idea of what fits into a quote breakfast category. I, I just don't like, you know, we Americans, we've engineered food so well to be so palatable and so calorically dense and like the dopamine spike. <laughs> it's hard to beat American breakfast cereals for that. Like, <laughs> thing, like it's it's bad for the whole society, but in this case, for doing a cross country mountain bike race, it is like engineered food for you to go fast. And who eats the most cereal that we know of, Jonathan? Well, it's, yeah, it's Keegan. Yeah, Keegan. You should see he downs that. He, it's insane. He mixes it's like, them. It's better than the than the aisle, the grocery store aisle. His pantry. It's pretty insane. Yeah, <laughs> but he eats so much cereal that he'll do like cocoa puffs with like fruity pebbles and he'll mix them together and then eat that so that it tastes different. Yeah. And uh, sometimes he has recipes. So yeah, and he mixes it on with a bunch of stuff. I think it's I I think like you said Nate there's a lot of stigma attached and and even Mary in like your question how you said like healthy versus non-healthy and that sort of thing and I think that we have to remember that our body is is in need of fuel and we should view things through that lens and we should like you said Nate allow that to um, alleviate the guilt that we have because we understand that right now these are special circumstances my body needs to perform it needs fuel and what it needs is carbohydrates it doesn't need a lot of fat it doesn't need a lot of protein and it doesn't uh, and you shouldn't be adding in a lot of fiber if you're if those are kind of the rules for your like pre-race breakfast then that should help guide you into spots where you're getting something that is going to leave you better prepared for the race and hopefully making less porta potty visits and actually once you start taking in all of your carbs on the bike your body doesn't have anything stopping that from happen happening um it's super important so it's like uh, your get out of jail free card. It's like uh, you get to use whatever you want on, on pre-race morning. So, yeah. So hopefully, Mary, that works out for you. And good luck. Uh, exciting. I don't know if uh, you'll be racing at Pan American Championships. If you are, uh, I would love to see you. And that goes for everybody here. Uh, that's going to be happening in, I think, the first weekend in May out in Utah. I'm going to be there. I don't know how prepared I'll be to race a Pan American Championship. Like that's like not just continental championships. It's pretty crazy, but I'm I'm can't wait for it. It's going to be awesome. I can't Can wait. Can I, uh, we'll talk about breakfast. Hannah, what'd you have for breakfast? This morning? Yeah. I had um, whole milk Greek yogurt with honey and granola. Nice. John, what'd you have? Yeah, uh, I had, because I have a sweet spot workout coming up today. Uh, a hard one too. Uh, so I ended up having white rice. I had about three quarters of a cup of white rice and then, and that's dry. That's not cooked. So it's a lot of rice that I had. And then after that, I had one egg in that rice and that was my breakfast. So, uh, and to be clear too, for like points, I'm going to be training at around 2 PM this afternoon, uh, doing that workout. So I find that if I do like a bigger breakfast, kind of like what Kyle said, if I do a bigger breakfast on these normal training days, and then for lunch, I do something that's pretty simple again, but it's not crazy heavy. That means I can go into the workout with a little bit of a lighter stomach and not as much stomach upset. So Nate, how about you? Did you do you have any I training had, on the killing? I had four scrambled eggs with a slice of cheese, three slices of whole grain toast, raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. I like a big glass of orange juice and two 
Icelandic yogurts, like 15 grams, non-fat ones, That's... and a banana. <laughs> and then iced coffee with soy milk. That's amazing. So after the training, that's when I get in. After the training, I'll have a smoothie. Uh, lots of berries, lots of fruit in that smoothie. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening, I get in a huge amount of greens. And then I usually add in, in addition to the greens, I'll add in something like sweet potatoes and I add in or brown rice into a salad, something like that. And I have a bowl. That's typically how like my, my nutrition goes. That, so that way I make sure I'm still getting this stuff. Cause I'm sure if somebody listened to that, they're just like, uh, that's like not a diversity, but before the workout, I don't need that stuff after the workout, mm -hmm. give it all to me. I want all the mm -hmm. variety and color. You know, for, for people who are maybe just tuned into right now, I'm focused on weight training and I'm about 212, 214. I'm trying to hit 220. So I'm trying to eat a whole bunch more and lift weights. And that was, remember, I used to race at like once, I think it was lightest was 179. Yeah, man. It was a big change. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's pretty fun being big. Yeah. <laughs> man, if I was a crit racer, ooh, that'd be fun. I'd be like Pete. You could push some people around. <laughs> I could push them. My FTP is like 180 right now, but, uh, if it was uh, high, think, it would be so, good. This is all hypothetical, but do you hypothetical, think, right? Do you think Nate, if you maintained your current weight, but then increased the amount of time that you were training on the bike, okay? Uh huh. Uh, do you think that your FTP that would enable you to get to a higher FTP than perhaps yeah. you did er earlier? Yeah, lower watt kg, but probably higher total watts. Power. So it would just be good for like flat four quarter crits, but anything with accelerations and stuff, I would be slower for sure yeah yeah absolute crit beast i don't know if you want to do that again though that's a that's a risky i'm just lifestyle. scared of crashing yeah <laughs> yeah too many yeah. concussions yeah. yeah yeah no doubt <laughs> okay emily's question it says hey trainer road crew listening to your podcast is my savior whenever i needed to drive an hour into boise idaho for groceries group rides and such i have a question regarding nutrition i have started ramping up training for the tour to bloom stage race in may and also incorporate strength training swimming and running this time of year yes i'm a triathlete as well you're in good company, Emily. All three of us here have uh, done triathlons before and trained for it. So um, no judgment. Uh, Emily then says, could waking up in the morning with intense hunger be a sign of underfueling? If it's really bad, I'll even have a headache and feel borderline nauseous or just feeling crappy. It's usually the morning after a hard or and or long session, and I call it my workout hangover, but no alcohols involved. Does anyone else have experience in this? I'm guessing it could be a combination of dehydration and, and under fueling, but I was wondering if anyone else ever experiences this and what triggers solution triggers um, or solutions there are. Uh, Hannah, I mean, I experience, I have experienced this many times. <laughs> I don't know about you. One hundred percent. I like that she calls it her her workout hangover with no alcohol involved because that is really exactly how it feels. You'll wake up the next day and you just feel like destroyed, um, headache, nauseous, like I'll even feel like you feel, you can almost feel it in your face. Like you're like, Oh, I just feel puffy. And like, anyways, it's, yeah, it, it can be really intense. I associate a lot of that feeling with the dehydration. Um, but I think that intense hunger is for sure under fueling. And I'd be really curious to know if you're waking up, hungry throughout the night as well because then that's interrupting your sleep as well um and i think i think yes it's under fueling we need to increase your fueling throughout the day throughout your workouts and i would also encourage you to increase eat something right before bed specifically to increase your quality of life in this specific scenario, waking up in the middle of the night and or waking up hungry in the morning. Um, so a good protein snack right before bed is often a great solution for that. Like I like to make it even a little bit of a dessert, like a nice little Greek yogurt. I'll I'll treat myself with some sort of like flavored Greek yogurt. Maybe I'll throw in some chocolate chips even. It feels like a nice little dessert and you're helping yourself recover overnight as well. That's a consistent thing I've seen with the best performing top athletes is that before they go to bed, and especially if you're a multi-sport athlete, uh, before they go to bed, they make sure that they don't go to bed hungry. Um, and that's And there's actually a study that I've been reviewing that we're going to cover on a future podcast that that whole sleep low thing, it looked into that and it's quite interesting. I'm just going to leave it at that. But, um, I, that's Hannah, do you do that? And to put this in context, when do you do that? Is that all the time uh, when you're training or is that, do you not do it on certain days and increase the amount that you take in on others? 
Um, the protein before bed, I definitely do anytime I'm training hard. But I think for me, there's two things I'm I'm at least really focused on my nutrition right now. One is overall protein uh, content for the day. So if I'm not meeting my protein needs for that day, this is an opportunity to bump that up. Um, and a lot of the time I do need that because for me personally, it's harder to con- hardest to consume of all the macronutrients, protein is the one I really have to focus on. And so allowing myself, hey, I'm going to get in this 20 grams right before bed as well, that helps my overall for the day. And then something else I'm very focused on is there have been studies that have found that at any point throughout the day, if you're in a 400 calorie deficit, you're not optimizing your ability to perform. And so by that, I mean, you might expend 2000 calories. And by the end of the day, you have also consumed 2000 calories. But if you waited to consume all those calories in the evening, and at one point during the day, you were 1000 calories in the hole, and then we filled all those at night, that was not optimal for your ability to perform as an athlete. And so for me personally, I'm always trying to be caught up with my energy expenditure and needs and not have these peaks and valleys. And I do that a lot by um, consuming snacks. So I try and have some sort of snack and or meal every two to three hours throughout the day. And that's a carbohydrate and a protein. And that also helps me achieve those macro goals throughout the day and stay honest with that and not hitting the end of the day going, oh, shoot, I'm, you know, 50 grams short on this or that and having to scramble to meet it um, when time's running out. (laughs) That whole process of trying to be like, do makeup work with the meal, uh, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Because you're behind. It makes it really tough to be able to stay on top of it. You mentioned that 400 calorie deficit. And Mm -hmm. I want to so I've, I'm looking at a spreadsheet right now that I've built out to be able to calculate kilojoules at like different power outputs. So then I can remember things because I always reference the wrong number. Like last week, I referenced the wrong number. To put this in context, you mentioned that 400 calorie deficit. If you pedaled at 120, 110 watts for an hour, you have burned enough calories that it equates to 400 calories right there. Now, would that mm-hmm. come from just carbs? Possibly, you know, you're, you're burning carbs and fat to be able to make that happen. And for most people, since that's a lower intensity, yes, you're, you're probably burning more fat than, than perhaps you are when you're up at higher intensities, but just keep that in mind. 110 Watts comes out to roughly 396 calories. Uh, so that's roughly 400, give or take the efficiency variance that we all have in ourselves. So that's like Nate, like, I mean, thinking of even an, a workout like recess, I'm doing with my FTP, I'm doing one and a half times that and for an hour, right? And there are a lot of times when I do something like recess and it's just an easy workout, an easy hour spin. And I'm like, "Ah, I don't need to eat anything. Ah, I'm good. And if I do that, but then I'm also falling behind in other areas and maybe I didn't eat well beforehand. Maybe I skipped a meal doing something else like that. I'm going to find myself in that spot, like you said, Hannah, of being Mm -hmm. in these deficits throughout the day that are then going to make things really tough. And if that carries into dinner and then that ends up carrying into the next morning, yeah, I felt, I feel terrible the next morning, completely cracked. And I think this is also a reason you just mentioned why it's important to even fuel short rides, but extrapolate that out to longer rides. It's even if you're consuming 100 grams of carbs an hour during some of these longer rides, you will not be replacing everything you are expending. And so if you're still 200 calories in the hole hour after hour after hour, you might be getting back to your house 800 calories in the hole. Um, And that's, you know, with good fueling. And luckily, 800 calories is something you can probably get home, make a good lunch and, and pick that up. But if you're not fueling well, and you're coming home 1500 calories in the hole, it's becoming a lot harder and a lot more complicated to try and pick up those pieces quickly. Yeah, this uh, you got to decouple caloric burn from effort and instead understand that caloric burn is equated to work. Mm-hmm. And like when you can do that, then that really helps because a lot of the time we just based on effort. I tried really hard, so I need a ton or I didn't try hard, so I didn't need a lot. Sorry, Nate, I think I interrupted you. No, um, there's this uh, on nutrition pro gainer which is horrible branding for cyclists because you think it's, it's a weight gainer. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it could be, but it depends on your calories. But one scoop, 
is a big scoop. It's like 650 calories, but it's 60 grams of protein and 83 grams of carbs. And I do that before bed. Like if I'm hungry before bed, I want to eat. And what Hannah just said, like, it's so hard to eat some kind of, um, I get lazy, like right before bed and I'll just go to sleep rather than try to make something really quick, but a shake, I can make it and drink it really fast. Um, I did it last night. And then when you wake again, I, I ate so much this morning cause I woke up hungry. I lifted weights late at night and it, it's, it is a sign if you wake up and I, before I did anything, I went and ate before I brushed my teeth or anything like that. I really wanted to, to get food in and I, I just, with the hydration too, how do you guys do it? If you do a late night workout and you get behind in hydration, mm. how do you do that without too drinking so much that you wake up a bunch of times at night, interrupt your sleep and then pee a bunch? It's, a challenge. it's like a balance, right? So then you don't, I don't know how to do it. Hannah, how about you? Oh, I mean. You probably don't work out late, late at night very often. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was trying to find a nice, the, for me, I pro. think. Yeah. Well, I just think as a pro, you're trying to optimize everything. Right. And so that that's your first indicator, right, is working out late at night. It is hard because it's not optimal. And that's totally fine um, that that's what a lot of people need to do. But yeah, it, it is it is tough for sure at that point. And I think, you know, I'd be curious, maybe someone has more anecdotal advice, but my advice would be to try and hydrate on the front end of that so that you're not falling behind in your workout as much and then needing to consume a liter of water before you get into bed. You know, try and be hydrating well throughout the day so that, again, just like calories, you're not dipping into those stores uh, as much in that late night workout. Yeah, like my workout this afternoon, I'm probably going to be somewhere around like 260 average power for an hour. Um, and at that rate, I'll be burning geez, like uh, somewhere around 930, 940 calories in an hour. And I'm going to sweat a ton, even though I'll have fans on me, like we've talked about uh, before, Nate, I'm going to lose a lot of moisture out of my body when I do that. So on hard workout days like that, when I know that's going to happen, I, I drink like liquid IV throughout the day leading up to the workout. And then I make sure that I'd get carbs and then also electrolytes during it. But Nate, the biggest problem that I have with that is the getting up. Like if you've drank a bunch of volume of liquid, then you go in there. So I just rely on making sure I'm getting as many electrolytes. Then hopefully I can utilize what I have, but it is a balance. I don't, I don't have a good answer for that one because I still like a, a good example is two nights ago. Uh, I did a hard workout in the evening and then I was, uh, yeah, get, I got up in the middle of the night to go to bathroom and that totally ruins your sleep you know, sucks. It's yeah. training, training late at night, man. Like I, it's th so many people do it that are not like, if you go to a gym, the evening it's packed, right? Like mm -hmm. that's like really common, super early. And then also late in the evening, it's really packed. But, uh, for us cyclists that are doing something like this and yeah, it's really, it's really hard. You know, you just, this sounds bad, but I just kind of adopt this perspective. If I'm training late at night, I like set my expectations lower. Like I might not perform as well. That's fine. I'm still performing. I just might not perform as well. Maybe that's a day when I pick a workout alternate if it's training late. And then in terms of like sleep, yeah, sleep's going to be compromised. I don't, because otherwise with my analytical brain, I'll panic and I'll be like, my sleep isn't optimized. What do I need to do to be able to like optimize my sleep? And I'll go through all this stuff. And then I go to sleep with an undone checklist in my head. And then I don't sleep at all anyway. So you just kind of have to like set the expectations lower. I don't know. I have a, I have a personal story about sleep that has nothing to do with cycling, but I, I want to sell it. Yeah. So my my yeah. house was broken into about a month ago, and I wasn't home when it happened. Did you know this, John? I no, I, told I you. didn't know. Yeah, Scary. so I wasn't home when it happened, and I could see them on camera jump over like a fence, come into the backyard, try windows, and they smash the back like sliding glass. They're into my bedroom within a minute, and the alarm went off, and then they ran out. For some reason, it was set up where like the glass break Spencer was sensor went off after a minute and they ran out and they they had a tesla getaway car which was pretty <laughs> crazy <laughs> but they had full masks on and like they were they like they were planned like wow um, they looked oh pretty God. pro and so my i have cameras that alert me of movement and i have those go through my do not disturb and sometimes though branches alert it so in the middle <laughs> of the night my phone will buzz and it will say intrusion alert oh no and this happened <laughs> last night and i look up 
and I have to wait like because it plays recording and you just it like spins for like ten so you're seconds. You're just like, like loading. <laughs> so like, into is your this house? a person or not? And I'm like, <laughs> if they're in, like they ran to the master bedroom, right? Because they're looking for valuables or something like that. They didn't take anything. They just ran away. Uh, no valuables. They <laughs> find like jerseys and stuff. <laughs> but they <laughs> why there's so many cycling shoes? <laughs> yeah, gels. gels. Just gels everywhere. Uh, <laughs> um. Anyways, like, uh, yeah, and then you see it, then you see, like, branches move, and you're just waiting for someone to, like, walk across, and then you're like, oh, it was nothing, and you go back to sleep. So that that's not a fun way to sleep anymore, and I, I'm not always at home, so I would have a dog. Like, a dog would be the best. Um, yeah. But it's just You're tough. allergic like, to dogs, though. So Yeah, we have a hypoallergenic little dog with my kids, um, but they switch houses, and it's, it's real. it's like, you know, you can hold them, and they're, that would be a great guard dog to alert, but uh, we had... <laughs> In Reno, we had another, uh, our CTO, they had somebody get into his garage while he was home. You remember that? Like, yeah, they, yeah. he was home and he, th- he heard, he thought it was his brother, but someone came in the garage, stole stuff and went. Scary. Um, this is scary stuff. Yeah. So anyways, that is also not a good way to <laughs> sleep. There's no real point to that story, but <laughs> I just didn't advisable. sleep well last night because of that. Yeah. Not advisable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really tough. And I know some of you are listening to this right now. They're like working on shift work and everything else. And Like everybody has a set of circumstances. And I think that we have to view it as like the individual challenge that we have to make the most of our circumstances, whatever they are, we have to work within those and then just do the best that we can within that. And you can't compare yourself to others. Like, like Hannah, her, her literal job is to be a professional to optimize her training. And that's why she says that it's, she doesn't often train in the evenings because she is intentionally trying to optimize. So don't compare to Hannah. Don't compare to anybody else. You just have to work within what you have. Okay, a little more to the story. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it. I've Again, had, I've had you can, you can fast forward, too. everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, so you can see on the video they were scared, right? And, and then when they had the the alarm went off, they were running as fast as they can. And I have hue lights in my house, right? And I have speakers. So Ooh. what I'm going to do is hook up ADT. So when the alarm goes off, I'm going to make the whole house go red. Yes, and then I'm going to play clown music. <laughs> like, oh my gosh! And then my friend, I have like, a friend who's and like a voice welcome actress. Welcome them into your home, like like you no, know, she's like, no even better. She's a voice actress, <laughs> and she's like, uh, she's the voice of I don't want to like I guess I can say it. She's the voice of like Baby Shark, Whoa. and <laughs> I want her to say like um, creepy things like we've been waiting for you or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> Just because I want to give the most unsettling feeling because these if that imagine you broke into a house and lights went red and it's like you know, I'm going to kill you now or something like that. Baby shark is waiting for you. Yeah. 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 In a, in a child voice, yeah. right? Like not say baby <laughs> yeah. shark, but they would, uh, they would probably run away because they were really scared and that would be creepy, right? That something okay. like that happened. Pavlovian um, the cops so didn't come for 45 minutes. So the cops aren't going to save you. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's pretty scary. So yeah. Anyways, I want to do something creepy like that, where it seems <laughs> like, like you're in a, uh, a movie, what like saw, you know what yeah, I mean? Like totally trapped. If somebody's if listening I, to this right now in the comments, well, of course, people listen to this in the comments right now, you should let us know on YouTube what you would do to discourage them. This is the, al- the algorithm is going to be really weirded out. Very different <laughs> content in our comments section. <laughs> if, if you put ring cameras in there too and recorded the inside, you could like sell that show to Netflix. You put honeypot like houses <laughs> around the world yeah. for people like <laughs> to break in. And then that stuff happens and just see what the criminals do. Oh, uh, that'd be great. That would be, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Netflix hit us up, slide into the DMs. Anyways, oh. Good idea. That, if, if I will post that online if I get anyone breaking in <laughs> and that happens. <laughs> That'd be well, great. Yeah. I love it. So yeah, hopefully that that helps. Um, yes, you are or so you are not alone in experiencing this. This is common. I commonly experience it after races like crits that are late in the evening or short tracks or mountain bike races. That's when a Hannah's probably thinking of like the fat tire crit at Epic Rides and they do those sort of things. You burn a lot of calories in a short amount of time and it's hard to take it in. So it's really common. Um If you have a situation where you recognize that's going to happen, like Hannah said, eat before bed. Make sure you're taking that in. I know that there's like a narrative out there that that's terrible, but eat before bed. You're not a normal person. You're not a sedentary individual that has to worry about that stuff. You're an athlete. And if you're a multi-sport athlete, even more so. Like keeping up on calories when you're swimming, biking, and running and you're doing multiple workouts a day is just so hard. So, uh, okay. Uh, Next question is from Matt. And if you're enjoying this podcast, by the way, let us know. Give it a thumbs up on YouTube right now. We're getting really close to 100,000 subscribers. I think we're at 98-something. Uh, so, oh, wow. Yeah, we're getting there. Keep going, y'all. It'd be great to cross 100,000. We definitely are going to do it before we get to uh, 
episode 500, whatever your ideas are for that. Matt says, I've been doing trainer row workouts for three or four years now, but always focused on longer events. I finally started focusing a bit more on crit season and doing some anaerobic work. Does anaerobic work inherently raise testosterone levels? I seem jacked up like I'm ready to hop into a football game or fight after finishing them. It's <laughs> a good question. Have you guys experienced this? No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel, Nate? <laughs> I don't want to fight feeling. after. Yeah. I want to lay on the floor. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you've been in a fight already. <laughs> yeah, I'm like exhausted and like I it could taste the blood, like the copper in my mouth, but like not. I don't want to fight anybody at all or feel jacked up. <laughs> How about you, Anna? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like we see this all the time, right? Like yeah. we literally see fights break out at the end of crits sometimes. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> right. Um, but this is also links back to kind of what we just talked about too in sleep. Like this is why sleep can be really hard after like a late night workout or a oh. late night race or something like that. Is we're all pretty just jacked up wired whatever you want to say um yeah i mean i think it's and if you took caffeine as well before this like man it's just amplified oh yeah i feel it's 100 percent with anaerobic work um unless it's like something that's extremely difficult then i do want to curl up in a ball afterward but otherwise no i do feel that like an anaerobic work in particular I looked into research on this and there is no research that shows specifically anaerobic work as having any sort of unique effect on the body from a, like a neurochemical perspective compared to aerobic work. Um, they do state like commonly that aerobic work that's longer causes fatigue and that sort of thing. Whereas aerobic or anaerobic work is typically shorter in nature, more intense, quick onset, and you're done. People generally also amp themselves up for those really hard efforts. Whereas if you're just going to be doing like a lot of aerobic work, it's probably not a whole lot. So there's, there's a lot of like assumptions in the research that that might have an effect. Sorry, Hannah, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to agree with that is I think some of it's a mentality as well and how we shift our focus. Because I know if I'm doing aerobic tempo, sweet spot, threshold even, as I'm doing the intervals, I a lot of my self-talk is about calming down, about like mm -hmm. focusing my breathing, about you know, like there's even we see, you know, someone could watch a movie during tempo or sweet spot potentially, right? But if you're doing anaerobic work, a lot of the time it's like fast paced music. You're really pumping yourself up. Your self-talk becomes a lot less of like calm down and more like go, 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 right? <laughs> like we can see just even the mentality shift so yeah i think just like you were saying even if there's not like that physiological difference we're definitely putting ourselves and our psychology in a very different place for these efforts i, I say go harder like the, <laughs> yeah like, that's your self-talk yeah I, uh i remember like the unr crit i won that at the end and i just remember just falling over off the bike and laying on the ground that's how like i like to end the anaerobic workouts where you you really feel like you're going to die uh, <laughs> and you, you can't do anything. And you know what I mean? Like it takes many minutes to be able to get back. It's like the end of a ram test. Mm -hmm. I don't want to fight anyone at the end of a ram test. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I know it sounds a little tongue in cheek, but really if you're feeling you can really, you have extra, like to get into a football game, extra energy, I would say you probably didn't go hard enough on that anaerobic ride. And it crits yeah. too. There's, there's fights because people get, I don't, the people who lose usually got dropped or like, you know, they, 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 there was energy left. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I see what you mean. But do yeah. you, but do you feel like a, a delayed, um, pump up? Like you finish your ramp test, you fall on the floor, you writhe in pain for a little bit. You look at your numbers. You're like, my FTP increased by 15 Watts. And then like, then do get, you get it? <laughs> yeah. I, I get the feeling like, so if I won like a crit or something and I'm driving home, I'll be exhausted, but my mind will be like super happy. Yeah, be talkative. yeah. Like I get talkative or something like that, mm -hmm. but not, not like I want to fight somebody. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. I've felt this after anaerobic stuff. Uh, the, the like the aggression <clears throat> that I feel after that sort of stuff. Um, and I feel it after like short track style races too. Like there's a and like they uh, they're uh, it, simultaneously. I feel completely cracked. Like I don't have anything left when it's a race. Um, but at the same time, I'm 
jacked up and I'm ready to go. Like when I'm going, mm-hmm. when I'm driving in the car, I don't want to listen to classical music. I want to like, I want to keep listening to metal afterward, you know? Um, so I do think- you listen to metal? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm broad. And also, case, so. this is like a really good time to make an aside that if something happened in the race that you're unhappy about, let's not talk about it at the finish line. Let's wait a little oh, bit because this so is you, this is the reason that we're talking about right now of why those confrontations can go south so fast. Yeah, you're not supposed to yell at the person as they come up. Before they're even close to you about why they did something wrong. Yeah. Not advised. <laughs> You're not advised. Nobody's in the right mental state, right? After that, like uh, everyone needs to detach from that moment for a while, you know? Well, it too, you feel a lot of times on that, especially if it's safety involved, you feel so personally wrong, like a boundary has been mm-hmm. broken mm-hmm. that something that is the spoken, unspoken rule. I mean, it's a rule, but also unspoken that we're not going to hurt each other. And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times it's not on purpose. Something that people don't even know they did it. Mm-hmm. And coming at it with the anger, people get so defensive then. Like, I did not mean to hurt you on purpose. How could you say that I meant to hurt you on purpose? Where if it is died down, you could talk about, hey, and when you did this, this happened to me and I felt unsafe. And they can say, oh, I didn't know that. Let's learn from it. I've had that experience before from great writers when I was starting out and I was older. Um, I mean, I would say they were older and I was younger. And it, I was so receptive to it, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it's... That's the way to do it, especially if you are the more experienced writer, to just chill some and talk to them. Say, hey, can I talk to you about this? Um, I think most people, too, are pretty, like, they want to hear that. They, they want to, like, understand and grow from it rather than, yeah. no one wants to get yelled at, though, in the middle mm-hmm. or after the mm-hmm. race. I think it is think, fine, though, in the, in the middle of the race, go, hey, 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 I'm here. Hey, hey, I'm here to, like, notice them. And that is 100% okay. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. As a general rule of thumb, I like to say, don't confront any situation after a race until you've eaten. Um, One, because (laughs) hunger can also amplify things, but also just because that will generally force you to take some time as well to go get food. Time will pass and then you can make a cognitive decision of how to handle it versus an emotional decision. That's a really good uh, rule to follow. That's that's probably all of life, Hannah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> great. People yeah, say exactly. eat on it. Yeah, yeah. hungry, yeah. angry, lonely, tired. Any yeah. of those don't don't bring those things up. Those are good rules. This is interesting though because I I do feel like a lot of this and there's the runners high. You know that people talk about um, and they talk about the different the fact that exercise in general releases a whole a cascade of very favorable uh, chemicals and hormones and causes a lot of processes to happen that are favorable, that are akin to actually uh, what you would get from uh, from a high that you might be getting from drugs. Um, yes, that does exist. I was really shocked though. Cause like instantly I went into this and I, again, I was like, I'm going to look at aerobic and anaerobic and look at the different impacts and a lot of research doesn't, or there's research that looks into mice and that sort of thing. And, but mice are not humans. Uh, so it's a bit complicated there, but there's not a whole lot of research that shows that anaerobic is different in that regard. But shockingly, I thought it was endorphins. Hadn't you all heard that like runners high yeah. it's endorphins. Mm-hmm. That's like the main mm-hmm. thing. Uh, there's a study that says exercise induced euphoria and anxiolysis or lysis, lysis, I apologize, hard to say word, uh, basically the reduction in anxiety, do not depend on endogenous opioids in humans. Uh, so this study investigated the cause of a runner's high um, and a tradition, and that's traditionally been attributed to endorphins. And basically there had been a study that was done in mice that showed that like, hey, it's not endorphins. Endorphins are not what causes the runner's high. Uh, and so this one was like, okay, let's look at humans. And instead what this one did is this focused on endocannabinoids or ECBs and the opioids released during exercise. Uh, previous research in mice suggested, like I said, that cannabinoid receptors are key and not opioid receptors. And they basically blocked opioid receptors and saw if mice still experienced these things. And sure enough, they did. So they worked with humans and they used these, like I said, they used a, a opioid receptor antagonist, uh, naltrexone is the name of it. And basically they use it in a controlled manner in an experiment with 63 participants. And what they found is that these participants still experience an increased euphoria and decreased anxiety after 45 minutes of running, even though they had all the receptors where endorphins would have actually made this happen. They had all that blocked, uh, which is really interesting. So uh, this is basically a semantic thing, right, for all of us, because in the end, the runner's high is the runner's high, but it's not endorphins. Instead, it's endocannabinoids is what we see is having more effect on the body and making us uh, feel that runner's high. 
just kind of yeah that's after a hard workout that's what i feel is happy and relaxed and that's Not exactly jacked up and ready to fight. That's exactly the effect that you would expect from the endo, endocannabinoids that you would have. Adrenaline and that sort of thing that you may get could absolutely be what you're feeling in terms of that. And that, like Hannah said, building up to it, the music you're listening to while you're doing it, how yeah. you're amping yourself up. And like Nate, you're saying, like, mm -hmm. go hard, go hard, do more. All that stuff is going to spike your adrenaline, right? And especially a crit, crit adrenaline is like mm -hmm. insane. It's a good drug, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah like, yeah. Uh, po so I think that there's there's these two different things. It's likely what you're experiencing if you feel that sense of satisfaction and calm and and happiness afterward. That's likely coming from those endocannabinoids that you're experiencing that are released, um, or I should say, produced and then processed. But uh, yeah, adrenaline I think is the best thing that I can get uh, from this, and. <clears throat> But man, Nate, you mentioned not going hard enough in the in the anaerobic workouts. And I think that that's, if you look at the workout description on a lot of anaerobic workouts that you have in Trainer Road, it's it's it says, if you want to go harder, go harder on these anaerobic efforts. And something that we recommend with a lot of people if they're training inside is to take your smart trainer out of erg mode and use resistance mm -hmm. mode for those really short spikes. And that way, if you, you can go harder when you do they those, shift. those efforts, yep. Just shift your gears and then you can exceed if it's 150% FTP, but you really want to, you feel like that's not hard enough. Go to raise that intensity, go up more if you want. So all that stuff is really important to, uh, keep in mind because anaerobic work, it goes away quick and it comes back super quick in terms of your abilities to be able to produce power at anaerobic levels and, uh, yeah, you can really get to the point where those workouts get pretty easy pretty quick unless you're really ramping it up. In our data set, like the relationships between levels and performance and RPE and stuff is all super linear in all the zones. Except anaerobic, it's not, it's <laughs> it's more, uh, there's a wider spread of performance relative to other zones that people do. And like, like you said, it's it's the hardest one to predict and get really dialed in. And that's where you can help the system if you do it by feel a little bit and like you do increase and i'm not saying you have to do it I'm, there's plenty of anaerobic, anaerobic workouts that i've done in erg mode that are just like perfect and i'm hanging on at the very end i'm like oh that was very hard that was all out which is where we want to kind of be um yeah so it, it's do what john said mm. <laughs> Hannah. i'd also be curious to pose the question to both of you so when you are feeling this um as we've now said, sort of this adrenaline spike, what do you do to bring yourself back down? Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's nice, but it's not always advantageous to maybe you did it in the morning and now you're going to the workplace and you're really jacked up or maybe you're going to sleep and you're really jacked up. Like how do how do you personally recenter into the parasympathetic nervous system? I mean, it's TikTok. Like, phone. <laughs> yeah. really just zone out like yeah yeah you know something mindless like i i relax yeah. a lot with that there's um there's a whole body of research on this and i want to look into it more i've like uh seen it come up in in searching for other things all over but where they use different stimuli to be able to take a person from the from that sympathetic state to the parasympathetic state and to do it rapidly and then mm -hmm. they basically look at different fatigue markers that a person might have or muscle damage or anything else basically mm -hmm. what they're trying to say is does recovery actually speed up and do we make more ground mm -hmm. on getting this person back to baseline if we introduce stimuli that ends up making this person feel more relaxed mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, one of the more common ones that I've seen, and I need to look into the research more, um, but one of the ones is music. And it's mm -hmm. changing the music that you listen to and intentionally using calming music thereafter. And I remember just from the abstract of one study, so once again, this is not me so citing everything, anything in particular, but they did see increased rates of recovery when people listen to relaxing music versus like energizing music thereafter, after the workout. So like... That is one thing, like I said, I don't want it. Like sometimes after race, I just want to keep listening to metal, but I try to force mm -hmm. myself to not do that uh, after mm -hmm. workouts because maybe if I was a pro, I, I have some more space to work with. Probably not because I'm filling it up with training. But for me, it's like, all right, I'm done. Now I've got to go back with the kids and I've got to get them ready mm -hmm. for bed and I've got to sleep. So that sort of ramping down stuff is key. I'm very affected by music. Like I like uh, it, it gets me way high and then it also can make me ball like a baby. Uh, so like, and I, so I really have to be careful about the things that I have around me that I'm listening to. So that's probably the main thing, uh, that I do. 
I'd really be interested, like breathwork uh, post training. We just did a breathwork session as a company, uh, which is really cool. cool. Um, thank you, Nate, by the way, for making that sort of stuff available for all of us employees and a uh, really cool session. And I'd be really interested to to test that out just with myself individually. And maybe I'll look into research too, if because there are a lot of different breathwork patterns that you can follow and everything else that do have a very profound calming effect on you. That could be cool to try. Yeah. I wonder, we don't do that enough in cycling. We never talk about that. The whole, like a little bit, but not a lot of breath work on the podcast. Yeah. I mean, we should look into research of that, of like getting the parasympathetic state after training and I'll just lowering it. Uh, uh, anxiety. And it's got to increase recovery, right? Like Hannah, do you have your down your head? Yes. Do you just agree or do you have information about it? Or do you do it? I, I think just anecdotally from my own experience, super impactful for me. Um, I think like I'm a very high functioning person. I have a tendency to really operate at like a hundred all the time. And I notice shifts in my recovery based on even day to day or even the season of life that I'm in of like, if I'm really busy and I'm going from ride to this, to that, to the other, even if they're not, you know, physical things, if I'm just staying at that high all day long, I do not recover the same way. And so for me, a huge thing um, of being a professional and, and being the best that I can be, like I'm always, I feel like I've always trained as hard as I can, um, but creating that space to be able to come down and recover has probably been one of one of the largest changes for me being a professional athlete. And I, I'm, I'm just curious what you all do to make that shift, because for me, a lot of it involves time about, you know, longer cool downs or creating time and space between my training and my next activity. And not everyone has that extra time. But I think regardless, creating that shift can be hugely impactful for your recovery and your next session, um, both mentally and physically. Because if you're riding a high from one session to the next, at least emotionally, when I get back on the bike, it's like, did I even stop training? Or has this yeah. been this right. the whole time? Um, yeah. And I think that I think that that you know, talking about like burnout and overtraining, a lot of that can start mentally and start mm -hmm. start. Um, uh, by not coming off of that. And so I think it's an important thing for people to consider and work on. Yeah, really good points. Uh, love it. Hannah, uh, the next question from Brett, this will be a fun one to get into. Uh, racing, Brett says, racing mountain bikes, I haven't found many better sources than the Trend Road Pod. Love hearing from Hannah, Keegan, Alex, and all the other guests who are pursuing it at a much higher level. I've been using Trainer Road for a couple of years, and one thing I know about myself is I will choose to ride my mountain bike over strict structure in training. And he mentions outdoor workouts and alternates have been a killer feature to help with this. I figured out all the local hills for VO2 work and have gotten better at making endurance workouts easy. Way to go. That's uh, that's a rarely cultivated skill. <laughs> a lot of people, zone two is just uh, anything you want to do, it seems like, uh, for a lot of athletes. So um, he mentions, but I'm still looking for the right way to do sweet spot on the trail. I believe the right approach would be to focus on spending as much time pedaling in the power zone. I found that at best, this turns into 50 seconds on, 10 seconds not pedaling for a turn, rock garden, spun out, etc. These little breaks will make RPE and HR much lower after these workouts, and I'm tempted to do these workouts by heart rate and RPE and not focus so closely on power. I would love to hear the other athletes and coaches' approaches to these workouts. Uh... I hear a sweet spot on the trail, and I think that unless you have very specific circumstances, I think that that's a really bad combo. This is coming from yeah. somebody, personally, I think I'm really good at training outside. Like, if you look at my power profiles on my workouts, I'm like, I'm like a surgeon. Like, I can match any power profile really well. Sweet spot is probably one of the hardest ones to do because it's this transition zone, right? It's not tempo. It's a blend between tempo and threshold, and it's certainly not threshold. And on mountain biking, the big problem often isn't going under, but it's going over. And that going over, when you can turn your sweet spot workout 
that the whole reason of prescribing Sweet Spot is to give you similar benefits to Threshold without the detrimental fatigue that you get from riding at Threshold for that long. It's very easy to turn it into a Sweet Spot or into a Threshold day. You get tired, suddenly tomorrow becomes yellow, becomes red, who knows, right? When it really shouldn't have. And the whole part about coasting is another like trigger point for me too. Like in terms of sweet spot work, and I don't know, you're smiling hand on this, but like you don't want to take breaks on those intervals if you don't have to. Like the, the point is to accumulate that time of consistent strain on those muscle fibers that isn't anaerobic, that isn't super hard, but it's just enough to drive the stimulus. And and small breaks like that, sometimes you have to take them to be able to recover and keep going on really tough days. But otherwise, it starts to make the workout ineffective. But that seems like a very strict uh, response for me. I don't know if you feel differently, Hannah. No, I mean, I this is like, I do almost all of my training outside and I have a, you know, huge, my, all of my training is structured. So these two things are not mutually exclusive in any regard, but I do pick my routes entirely based on my structure. And your sweet spot days are not the days to ride the trail. It's just not. And I just, yeah, this this is like a, a little bit of a trigger point because there are so many times that you can ride the trails. Why does it need to be this day? Um, I get it. It's so fun. Do it a different day. Um, I think that sweet spot, like you can absolutely do it outside. You can do it on the road. You can do it on gravel. Um, you can do it. I mean, even if it's like rolling terrain on the gravel, as long as you can maintain that wattage on the rollers by shifting, that's actually great practice to learn how to shift to stay in that zone. So it's not that, oh my gosh, I need this perfectly flat road or this perfect hill. It just means you can't be coasting. You can't to turn or to descend or whatever that is. And it definitely can't be okay, my goal power at the end of this interval is whatever it might be, 200 watts. So I'm going to go way above after I coast every time to even that out. This is not the workout. That's an entirely different workout. Um, So my recommendation to you would be if you still really want to get in some mountain biking, you know, every day you train or specifically on these sweet spot workouts, find a road or gravel road or whatever it may be close to your trails, warm up on your trails, then go out, do your structure on that terrain that matches the structure, and then come back and finish out the aerobic aspect or fin- or cool down on the trails, and then you get the best of all worlds. Yeah, for sure. It's it's just a tricky one, uh, especially if you have high sweet spot levels, right, Nate? Like you start to get into like 20 minute, 30 minute sweet spot intervals, like some big long ones and that sort of stuff. The, it's key. You'll notice that in a lot of those workouts, you're getting into really short breaks in between intervals. Like sometimes it gets down to like one minute that you'll have, you know, as, as like a break because that short little break does cause a huge amount of like relief to come from when you're just steady on that power. But yeah. And that's one of the differences between indoor and outdoor training, especially for endurance too, of why it can feel really hard to do two hours of, you know, a zone two with zero breaks versus two hours on the, on the road where you have these little micro breaks of a second here and a second there. Um, and sweet spot even more, like all those benefits of the, those little breaks and on the trail happens all the time. And what you'll see with workout levels V2 also is those little breaks are going to really lower your score. Mm-hmm. So you're going to think you're doing a level five threshold or a sweet spot. You go through there and you come out at like 2.4 or something like that. And you're like, no, I, the time and zone is the same. And it's not the time and zone. It's, it's that muscular endurance that's being trained, like not taking the breaks. So like, like yeah, just do it someplace else. Yeah, I completely agree. It's kind of funny some t- like, uh, and Keegan and I are always sharing our workouts with each other every day. And we're like, we're, we're each other's hype men uh, when we're training. And when we do that, uh, a lot of the time I'll, I'll say the workout. And the question is always like, are you doing it inside or are you doing it outside? And when I do it inside, it's cool. You know what his reaction is? He's like, oh, that's extra credit. Like, that's like, that's like, you're going to get a, a very well-structured workout, you know? And that's, that's the truth behind it. Um, if you live in a place like Tucson, for example, you have the opportunity to go ride four hours in one direction without a single interruption on a straight road with like hardly any change, right? 
I know that most people don't live in those circumstances and it can be tricky. I try to find, like you said, Hannah, there are certain spots where you can find like loops um, and you can do that. Uh, like big loops that allow you to be able to just maintain steady power. Another tip, you like to ride your mountain bike, ride your mountain bike on the road, and then it Mm -hmm. can take a climb that on your road bike, let's say that it might take you something like 10 minutes, but on your mountain bike, it now takes you 15 minutes to do that climb because of the increased drag and everything else. And suddenly you now have another road that works great for longer intervals that you can do on the mountain bike. And Honestly, for mountain bikers, I advocate riding your mountain bike on the road pretty often because you have another safety, a level of safety too. Uh, if there's something in the road and you need to swerve around it with a mountain bike, you're probably not going to have to swerve. You can just hit it and it'll be fine, like a piece of glass or something. Or if you need to go into the shoulder, you're fine and you don't crash. Uh, it's really, I just like to suggest that for mountain bikers. It's don't feel like you have to ride a road bike on the road just because it's the road. It can be a really good way to get in good training. And on the note as well, we're talking about loops. Let's say that you have something that's like a, uh, a turn that's like, you know, you have to turn and usually you'd have to slow down for that turn. You don't have a stop sign that you're running or anything else like that. Okay. But just like a turn that you might have to slow down for on a mountain bike, you're going to be going slower because it's not as fast rolling as a road bike. And you can carry more power probably through that turn on that mountain bike by just dragging the brakes. It's going to be a bit more stable, less finicky. There's just a lot of perks about training in particular on that mountain bike on the road. It can make it a whole lot better. So, yeah. And as for your suggestion of going based on heart rate and RPE, Mm -hmm. it's not a horrible decision if this is what the decision, if you're going this route and you're like, I'm doing it on the trails no matter what you say. But you have to understand that it that it's less good. Um, and the primary reason for that is your heart rate and RP. Yes, you might be in sweet spot heart rate zone, but you're not producing the power that goes with that. That sounds obvious, but you have to think of it from a muscular standpoint of your muscles are physically not gaining the load that they need to in order to pass this workout or move on to the next phase or whatever it might be. So you are straining part of your body correctly, but you're missing another part, which is why, sure, it's it accomplishes some of it, but it does not accomplish all of it. Yeah, really well said, Hannah. That was awesome. Uh, Mandy's question. My husband and I share the same power to weight ratio, and recently we completed our local winter. That's got to be hyper competitive, by the way. Same power (laughs) to weight ratio in the in the marriage. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And recently we completed our local winter short track race series. Upon reviewing the results, I can't help but feel a twinge of frustration as I noticed the considerable difference in our lap times. Despite my racing in the Masters Women category and having relative open space, he navigated through significant traffic in his category. I had anticipated minimal disparities in lap times given the mostly non-technical nature of the course. Could the noticeable gap be dis- be attributed solely to differences in bike handling and technical skills? What do you say, Hannah? Absolutely. I mean, I think when you're getting down to the nitty gritty and or the pointy end of pro races we can look at for example a lot of the athletes up there are probably sitting at really similar uh power to weight ratios because we're pushing up against what's possible um but we still have a winner we still see big differences and part of that is that racing isn't just a power to weight ratio that's sort of like your ticket to entry and then how you win is based on all these other things everything from like you're saying the technical aspects to pack dynamics and drafting to your zones outside of ftp it's very unlikely that you went and you just held ftp this whole race you probably were spiking and recovering (laughs) exactly right like you're probably spiking and recovering and so It's like, how how good is your VO2 zone? But also, how well are you recovering in between? How well are you carrying momentum and therefore not putting out power so that you can put out more power later? There's so many aspects to a race that, um, you know, we really could dig, dig really deep into this. But the bottom line is, yeah, that that basically is what racing is. And that's what makes it so fun. Mandy, this is huge. Like, John, how many cross cyclocross and mountain bike races locally? But I mean, 
I can be people under a watt kg less than me will beat me. It is, <laughs> it is crazy, right? Like yeah. it's, I'm serious about this. If it's really technical, um, and I'll pass them all the climbs and stuff, but it, it is insane. Uh, and John, you've always been higher watt kg, but I got pretty close mm-hmm. on the road. We'd be pretty close mountain biking. It would be like, you know, 30, 40, 50% faster than me, uh, yeah. on lap times. It's insane. We're on a crit, like yeah. we would be neck and neck the whole time. Like we couldn't drop each other yep. if we tried. It's um, kind of, it's kind of interesting too, because there's like a level that I didn't really appreciate this beforehand, but if you're not as good of a bike handler, you're probably dealing with a heightened level of anxiety mm-hmm. while you are riding. Oh, yeah. And, and oh, that yeah. has a big, like fatiguing effect and like a hindering effect on your ability to perform across the board. You yeah. know, um, even if you have similar power numbers, it's going to affect all your efficiency going in and out of every turn and dealing with everything. You're probably going to be breaking more and it's, yeah, it's, it's it really builds tough. builds on itself. Yeah, it does. Yeah, you make one compounds. little mistake and then you start, you start hitting the brakes early every time and then like you mess up turns and then it gets scarier and you go slower and then people are yelling at you. Yeah. It's, yeah. John experiences with swimming and he yes. knows now, like getting <laughs> oh, out of it. It's exactly. It's terrifying. You're exactly yeah. right, Nate. Yeah. This there's another thing that could ha- be happening here though. Short track often has situations where it's like super steep little things that you're going up, right? And it but it's short lived. If you're at the same power to weight ratio as somebody like Nate and I, maybe we're at the same power to weight ratio, but Nate's power is way higher than mine. Nate may weigh more, but his power is way higher. Let's say that you have a short little steep climb on that course and it only lasts five to ten seconds, but every five to ten or every time you do it, you have to do six hundred watts to get up that climb because it's really steep. For Nate, that 600 watts is going to hurt him, even though we're the same power to weight ratio, it's going to hurt him less coming into that than me because 600 watts is going to be really tough. And what I'm saying is 600 watts, not just based on weight, but you know, there's kind of like a floor to certain climbs where you realize with normal gearing, like, okay, 600 watts is just what you have to do to get up this thing. Um, and Nate might have more momentum with more weight getting carried into that thing. And as a result, it's easier for him to go up yeah, something steep and there's like, there's a lot of little spots where sand or something else that, that maybe that's causing you to drag that sucks 50 Watts out of everybody. And for you, since you're at a lower power to weight ratio or same power to weight ratio, but lower threshold, that 50 Watts really hurts you. Right. So there's a lot of little things in short track, consider all the accelerations that you end up doing. All that hurts a rider with a higher power output less than it hurts you. Oh, yeah. Even if you have the same power to weight ratio. This too is his, uh, so if they have the same power to weight ratio, I think you're just saying this right now, but one is an absolute higher, the yes. man is probably at the higher watts, just put out higher watts on the flats, right? Yes. And the aerodynamic difference isn't the same. That's, that's probably also a huge, huge aspect of it is if you're at, uh, to give you an example, let's say you're at 3.5 watts per kilo at 120 pounds versus 180 pounds, right? <laughs> Yes. Oh, the climb, you might be the same, but everywhere else in the flats, you're going to destroy at 180 pounds at the same one versus 120. Yeah. Um, and John, you make a good point too with the the benefit of inertia on rolling courses. If it's a big, steep road, it's it's not. But so many times, your big rider, you keep pedaling into that like little little hill. And I see, I just roll past all those light people. They start hitting the rocks and they like, it slows them down a whole bunch. Mm-hmm. I kind of float up to it. And then if it's more than a, you know, 20 seconds, I start to get passed by the the light riders, but you kind of just blow through, especially on something really chunky, that weight that you're carrying that you built up the inertia, uh, really helps to go, uh, to go on those. You got to use that to your advantage. And that's a big benefit for bigger riders. Yeah, absolutely. And then for a smaller rider, right, Hannah, it becomes like all about efficiency and you're always Mm -hmm. looking for ways to not lose your momentum and ways to be able to maintain it. And like the lines, you can't just be as sloppy with your line choice. Instead, you really want to pick the sand that's packed down because that's going to hurt you less. Like it, uh, I'm sure that you've noticed that um, racing, especially in these gravel fields where you're racing with men and women and probably super big dudes with big power to weight ratios that are with you. Yeah, I would use this as a, f- as a really fun opportunity though to, um, you know, if you have a similar power to weight ratio, you should be able to look at some of these things and and be excited because, oh, wow, okay, with X, Y, and Z, I could go faster. If I carry more momentum here, I could be faster. Um, you have the ability. So how can we, you know, start to really race rather than just produce power to be 
faster. And I would be so curious. I mean, if this was my household, I would be totally nerding out, pull out both of your power files, look like, are they the same? And just, you know, um, different speed? Or are you seeing, oh, wow, I'm spiking here and you were fl- and it w- you just carried the same thing. Or maybe you're producing the same power up every climb, but oh my gosh, you coasted into it and I was already doing 200 watts. Like there is just a whole world that you can explore that would be really fascinating by overlaying these files. Yeah, it's we've kind so of many, fun. It's kind of fun, we, right? We've talked about like building a product about that as it'd be so much fun to look at your own times and see how you go mm-hmm. through uh, different sections and, and also to like pull everyone from a race and see that. I think what Pete was always like him and his friends would look at who in a crit could coast the most. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And that's such a great metric so to show that you're being efficient of who could coast the most into it. Uh, yeah, yeah that would, that would kind of be cool. Like, who did not get dropped from the Peloton, but coasted the most, they're being the most efficient and should relative have the most power left over at the end for finishes or attacks or something like that. Yeah. And this is why I think that we're seeing more and more riders now is all nutrition and training and everything else. We're learning more about it. We're seeing riders like Matthew Vanderpool, like climb really well on these big climbs. They have a really high threshold, but then everywhere else they just dominate, you know? And it's interesting to see a rider like Tom Pigcock, his skill is just so darn good that I, I bet that his power to weight ratio is probably very similar to theirs. But he has the skill to be able to hang with them. But even then, if you look in a lot of like the big flat races, that sort of stuff, he can't hang. Um, and it's for the same reason. So I think that's why some of the cross racers are actually so good. It's not because they have some crazy genetics. It's because their efficiency to be that good in cross, like they oh. had to be so amazing. And then that little bit transfers over to the road over seven hours, right? And they're, the, the, the differences are so razor thin. And this stacks up over many races or stage races, and yeah. they just have more energy. Uh, and yeah, that, I think that's that's probably one of the key things. And you because t- you take a you take the road cyclists and put them on a cross bike, yeah, and they're not going to be able to compete at all because they they just can't handle that way. Well, yeah, that's the benefit of short lapped racing, like criteriums and cyclocross you build up, like you get a chance to improve every time. And especially in like cyclocross, it's more dynamic Mm. and you get get the chance. (laughs) Get the chance. (laughs) And, uh, and, uh, but when you get that chance over and over and over, it starts to like put you in a iterative mindset where you're like, okay, I have opportunities to iterate and improve. And I do that all the time. When that becomes your quote workflow and how you operate, it makes it so that you accelerate your rate of improvement. Whereas if you're just doing road races or you, it's not the same course and everything else, you miss out on those opportunities to kind of search for that sort of thing. It's a really good point. Yeah. They, they're just hyper efficient because of that. The, and the, some of the best training that I've done on a mountain bike is in a clinic. And there was a loop that we would do that was literally maybe 15 seconds long. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you do a little climb and then there was a little short downhill maybe of, you know, a second, but it would be a turn at the end. And there's different ways you could take that turn. And let's do this a hundred times. Right. And then, and then there, uh, the great part was a coach would be like, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. But over and over and over again, you might say you're going to be good at that turn, but you start seeing that turn everywhere else. Right. Yeah. After you could you do it, then you do all the opposite way and you turn the other way. And that, yeah. that is so much e- better for me, at least when I was, um, the whole time actually than, than doing like a two hour loop. Yes. Every 15 seconds, you get a chance to try again. That's huge. Yeah. And to get new information added to it. To get the feeling right. Yeah. It's great. All right, last question is from Aaron. It says, thank you for the amazing podcast. I found it to be the best training companion I've ever had. Thank you, Han- or Aaron. That's great. Uh, I've got a question that I'd love to hear everybody's input on, but particularly Hannah's. I raced track competitively in high school, triathlon and college, and these days I'm doing a bit of everything, but I'm particularly enjoying time trials these days. Which brings me to my question. I've had a late start to my training this year due to a minor surgery that has a long recovery time. This long recovery time will see me missing the first six races of our weekly TT series, and I feel like by the time I start racing, everybody will be so far ahead of me. How do all of you cope with the fear of missing out with early season racing that you can't attend, but can witness all of your competition absolutely crushing it? That's a good question. And Hannah, um, BWR Arizona just happened this weekend. So is this like relatable to you or like, <laughs> those are all the people you're going to race this year? You didn't race that race because you've been doing other stuff. So maybe they yep. have FOMO when watching you. I don't know, but 
Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, and that I'm so glad you brought that up because that exactly what you just said. Yes, I 100% experienced FOMO. Like, I really wanted to be at that race. It was a really hard decision that in my mind it was like, okay, this is a decision of maturity. That doesn't mean I liked doing not <laughs> it doesn't mean I liked making that decision, right? But we have to make hard decisions and exactly like you said, I felt like I really missed that race, but when I was not there, they weren't at a different race I did. Um, And so there is give and take. We're not all on the same exact calendar and schedule. And so that's the first thing is you need to be really, um, you need to zoom out and see that, right? Of like what you're doing isn't the same as what they're doing. And so you can't expect yourself to always show up in the exact same places. Um, And then Also remember what your goals are. And so sometimes when I'm trying to make these really hard decisions, again, I have to step back, zoom out and say, okay, well, what is my main goal for the season? What do I really want to achieve more than anything else? And is making, is going to this race getting me further away or closer to that goal? And if, if you can make, if you, have a clear indication for that, you have your answer and you have to hold really firm to that, even though it's hard. Um, If missing the race isn't in your power, like it sounds like in your circumstances, Erin, you know, you wish you were there. Maybe it would be getting you close to your goals, but you simply can't because you had this surgery that has a long recovery time. You might experience that fear of missing out, but you literally can't be there. And so you have to step back and focus on the things that you can control. You know, don't torture yourself. You can't be there. So stop thinking about and worrying about something you can't control. Easier said than done. Um, And so usually for me, it's focusing on the things I can control, right? Like control your improvements, whether that's on the bike or in the rehabilitation for the surgery. Um, Get races on the calendar that you can do and you are excited to do and set goals for that. And as you work on improvements, like imagine your little person moving closer to those goals as you achieve those improvements. And then add a little bit of realism um, to your situation. And this is personal anecdote. I don't know if it will reach vibe with everyone, but I feel like every single year at the start of the season, it feels like every race is the most important thing. It's yeah. like, this is so critical. This person's winning. This person's winning. This person's going to be the best because they won the first race. And then it hits October and literally can't even tell you who won the first race. Like these things come and go so fast, but year over year over year, we still get hung up on these first season races. And you also have to remember that, like you said, you're watching your competition crush it. Totally celebrate them. A race wins great. But you have to remember that the person you're watching race now will very likely be a different athlete two to three months from now. So don't get hung up feeling like, well, they're here and I'm here. Well, they might not be there. Like they might have peaked. They might be coming down or they might be way faster even, you know, so don't get caught up worrying about things that are going to ebb and flow. And then on an even better note, if you come in and you crush it in the second half of the series or or season, no one's even going to remember that you missed those first couple races, probably including you, because you're going to be so hyped up on the fact that you came in and won all these races. So just zoom out, see the full picture. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> That's really good advice. A question for you too. Do you get faster in training or racing? Training. <laughs> training. training, right? Yeah. yeah. So when they're racing and uh, I, those races that I miss, and I can do a really good workout that day that I know is, you know, more TSS, more my plan. Because races either, for me, are usually aren't hard enough, like a crit, to really, mm-hmm. like, it's hard, but not the kind of training series I need. Or it's so big where it's like Carson City and it's five hours and it's going to blow me up and I'm going to get a red day and all that, you know. Um, and you get that consistent, I just pedaled for 90 minutes straight in sweet spot and I did three intervals of those and like, you know, right peak plus two. And that just pushes me forward and then I don't have to recover as much after the race. I don't taper for the race. I'm like, I just gained a week on these people, maybe a week and a half. Uh, it's so true. Yeah. I mean, that's, 
like pulling back the curtain a little bit, that is why I didn't go to BWR Scottsdale. Um, I wanted to be there. It would have been so fun. But I'd already raced the Mediterranean Epic. I had already gotten that preseason race in. And looking at BW Scottsdale, it's like by the time you travel there, do course recon, race, recover, travel back, you're you're missing at minimum a couple days of quality training. And I felt like putting in that training block at this time of the year, this early, for me was more valuable. It doesn't mean for everybody, but for yeah. me was more valuable. And that's what you have to hang on to is making those decisions and then like own it. There's no waffling around. <laughs> and I'll make sure I'm clear on this too, is that for some people too, the race is that training of like the group tactics, the yes. uh, group riding, the trail riding at speed that you do need that does make you faster. But for some people, like Hannah's not going to need to practice on the trail there to get faster, right? Or like she doesn't need an extra race like uh, to finally feel comfortable in a race. That's that's not what it is. Mm. Um, and I don't, for me, road was like that. And John, I think mountain bikes like that for you. You don't need a, an extra time on the trail to get faster on the trail. You need to get yeah. higher walk kg. Well, and regardless of the race, the type of racing I'm doing, that racing like uh, competency comes back so fast. Mm -hmm. Like, True. give me one race or two races, and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, here we go. This is how we do it. And whereas the training, it does not take one or two workouts. <laughs> it <laughs> takes a lot. Um, so I really like that point that you made, Nate, of flipping the tables and realizing mm -hmm. that you aren't missing out. Um, Hannah, that was one of your, I know your like assessments of your season last year. You're like, I raced a lot and it was mm -hmm. awesome, but I want to change that moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I want to be very choosy and specific about what I do. And, and, uh, that's a good example. I think that we can learn from. So remember every race is usually sandwiched by two days of unproductive stuff. Uh, and that's minimum. If you're doing mm -hmm. something that involves travel or anything else, it's three to five days that you basically have compromised training. So if you keep that in mind, uh, you're probably in a really great sp spot where you're at right now. So, yeah. I know some people too, they like to do like a race before the race, kind of like a, like a local crit or something. I love doing, you know, building so much time on the trainer and not really knowing where I am to my competition. And then we drive down to California yeah. and it would be, it would be so much fun because the pressure isn't there as much, I think too, where in the local race, you either disappoint yourself or you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so good. I better finish good in this next race. Yeah. Where they come to the aspect of like, I don't know where I'm at, but I know I'm going to go so hard because I've been wanting to race so much and I'm going to put everything I can on this race. Yeah. And, and I know I've prepped really well. And, um, I'm telling you like, yeah, especially with time trials, this. we're, th you know, we're talking time trials here is what Aaron likes to do most. In that case, yeah. it's even more important, like relevant to what you're saying. The, mm -hmm. but the man, the, for me at least doing i have spent all my training indoors to race crits and i i will say i crush crits like yeah, especially relative for my my yeah. performance in history it is it's so much better than riding outside the road i was a million times yeah. but um <laughs> it is okay to just train through those things and then just crush the crit without having to ride the crit if you can ride in a pack and like yeah. you can take corners and that sort of thing if you can't and you know do your sprinting outside and stuff that caveat but if you can do those things man just do the training, get it all right, and then kill that race. And hope you don't flat. Like, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> yeah. A, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I feel really like helps I, to be able to approach it with curiosity, like you said, Nate, and 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 go yeah. in that direction. Sorry, Hannah. Oh no, I just I also feel like we always look from the perspective that we want to look from right like you're having that fear of missing out and so i'll catch myself saying things like well everybody's there and then someone will say well who's everybody and i can list like three people you know yeah. and so i think you also <laughs> again right like yeah. zoom out really question yourself really allow yourself to see that big picture because uh, it's probably different than the story in your head uh <laughs> is being told <laughs> My daughter just told me that everybody has Snapchat on their phone and she's 12. And I was like, really? Who has Snapchat on their phone? And she named one person and who was an eighth grader. I'm like, yeah, you're not getting Snapchat. <laughs> this is not happening. She just got a phone to go to like to Texas when she's at a, like a sporting event. It's all controlled and stuff, but oh, it's a big deal. But yeah, she asked for Snapchat right away. And I was like, no well, way. Nope. <laughs> I, am too, I am too into tech to know that you should not have Snapchat. <laughs> yeah. oh, what those other parents should not... If, yeah. Yeah. That you should not uh 
there's a lot of a lot of parents on this thing and you can totally lock down your kid's device in ios i was in a parent teacher thing at our school jonathan uh-huh. and one teach one parent said the way they found out their kid had snapchat was she to open snapchat and it suggested that kid as a friend oh, so she was suggesting no. she was suggesting all the parents to open their phones and look for the kids as their friends <laughs> rather than just like locking Lock down, down ios so you can't install it that so a big oh, yeah, point yeah. of that is, is that you don't know, uh, man, this is way off topic, but <laughs> the internet for like young kids, is kind of like a loaded gun, right? You don't know when you go oh, to somebody so else's dangerous. house, what yeah. the guns are there, but really like the, they, I saw this, uh, thing where they, they put up like fake, uh, profiles of girls, like 12, 13, 14 on Instagram, opened it up and it was in like minutes men were, uh, I'm sure they had some kind of hashtags and stuff on post, but minutes where men were messaging them, it's like terrifying. older men. Yeah, and you don't know when you go to a kid's house what they're doing on, you know, someone else's phone too. And that sort of stuff is, can really, you know, people, uh, kids can get depressed with the consequences of that and there can be predators and, you know, abuse and all that sort of thing. So it is Nate, really good to know terrible... that the parents are... That's like a terribly frightening thing that you're going. No, it's a terribly frightening. Yeah, that too. But terribly frightening thing that you're having to go through with your kids getting a phone. I'm convincing you myself that it's just never going to happen. And I'm never it's all about it. <laughs> education, though, and yeah. you know, a, a mix between education and uh, um, and preventative um, like approach. Yeah, and preventative, right? You can iOS is cool. You can say you can only text grandma. You know, these three friends. Uh, yeah. You know, mom, dad, and and that's it. And here are the things and the websites you can go to and stuff like that. It's pretty good. It's when they get to that age where you, you know, you don't lock them down anymore, where you hope you train them well yes. enough or not train them, <laughs> educated them <laughs> well enough to be able to make decisions on their own. And that's what being a parent's about, right? That's right. And I want to take this and pivot it to a question that I had for Hannah. And this will be the last one that we do. Hannah, Does she have Snapchat? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, do you, surrounding your racing or your training, do you adjust your social media consumption mm. and like intel, like, like strategically around that? I don't know if you do or not. Um, that's a really good question. I, I would say probably the answer would be yes. It's not so strict. Like I know some athletes won't go on social at all during like this block or that block. I'm, I'm not quite that way. But there are definitely things that I maybe choose to not look at a certain page or um, maybe a certain athlete, even if I'm really good friends with them, like I can communicate with them in text. I don't necessarily need to see the highlight reel, right? Like I've definitely had friends of mine message me about something going on on Instagram and it's like, oh yeah, like let's unpack this because it's it's never fully what meets the eye. So um yeah, I think it's definitely something to be aware of and careful with in all aspects of whether you're feeling on top of the world or maybe less than you want to be. You have to always find that neutral ground. Yeah, I th- I think that so this is a spot where like uh we'll be covering this on the next research review that we do. Uh there's research like emerging in this and even some stuff with athletes that I think is ongoing but not published yet. I, I at least was told Um, but this is definitely a spot where I think that athletes can, um, improve performance that may be, they may not even understand the impact of it right now that it may be affecting them. Um, it's such like a, it's such a dangerous place for comparison that then can drive you away from the things that you're committed to that, you know, are going to be the best long-term focuses and, and then also even on the other side, just like the, the dopamine effect side of things. And if you're just constantly locked into it, it can make things chemically complicated for you come come race day when you have so many other emotions coming in it's it's worth consideration you know well and you have to remember that everybody is different and needs different things and is on a different journey and that sounds so cliche but um gosh it's just so true and i think of that even of like let's call strava social media i know a lot of people who struggle with that one of watching hours of rides and digging into rides and like you don't know what their recovery was like. You don't know. Yeah, you you just there's so many pieces that aren't told in that story that even if someone's riding more than you or less than you, it does. It's not an indicator of success or growth or happiness or any of these things that we tell ourselves it is. It's just 
the goal is that it's just a way that we can interact and be social since social media. It's not supposed to be an indicator of performance or quality of life or anything that we try and make it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Nate, anything to add before we close it? I mean, that no, I mean, at the pressure of social media, John, like us performing at races, like I think it's probably similar to what pros have too, but just friends have it too. You say you're going to do really well. That's why some people drop out of races and stuff. And man, the Cape Epic pressure, whoo, that was huge. I think that probably, you know, I pushed myself. I don't, if I didn't have the pressure, I know I don't, I don't think I would have crashed because I would have been going way slower on the course and not been, I was so exhausted. I remember when I, I was like up with you and Brandon for some of the race. And yeah. that was, I was hitting like all time power PRs on day two of day <laughs> eight, like an hour in, uh, yeah. that was not good. And that was all the pressure of trying to do well with Sophia, right. And not letting Sophia down and, and, uh, yeah, and the world was, knew about it, you know? So it's and, yeah, it, life changing for me. Right. Cause of the, the whiplash and stuff. And I remember being on the, on the, the trail and, like kind of feeling bad about myself. I'm like, am I giving up? And then mm-hmm. Sophia's like, he's good. And the medic's putting like the flashlight in my eye. And she's like, he's good. He's like, oh no, he has a concussion because like, my eyes weren't dilating or something with the yeah. with the light. Um, all because, you know, I think if I'm risking my health all because of pressure from uh, outside pressure that I put on myself, right? Yeah. Um, you that I need to. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Um, so maybe a good thing to analyze for a lot of athletes if you're if you're feeling that right now and around your training and the Strava thing, uh, um, Man, a lot of people tell me that like they, they'll send me DMs and they'll be like, and they'll send me their training. I look at it and I say, why did you skip all these workouts? That sort of thing. And they're like, oh, well, I just saw everybody else doing way more, you know? So I wanted to do those things and Ooh. it's Ooh. tough, man. It's really hard. <clears throat> Let's bring all back around. Red light, green light will help you modulate. The other yes. cool thing that we have now is on the back end. It's a slider to say how aggressive you want to be or conserve in your training. I didn't mm-hmm. mention this. So yeah. yeah. There are certain times where you do want to, you can optimize your recovery, sleep, nutrition, and you want to like go from A to B in terms of volume or watt kg. I think we've all had this, right? Mm -hmm. Things are lining up, works fine. You don't have like a new baby in the house. You can slide it to the right and say you're going to be more aggressive and know that's like, it's like a stock market. You're going all stocks, less bonds. Risk reward (laughs) is higher. (laughs) But also you can go on the other side, you can be more conservative on it and you, um, the, It'll be easier to trigger those yellow and red days, less likely to be fatigued. You know, uh, sh- new job, shift working, new baby, 100%. Uh, also, if you just want to maintain, right, this is a great way because it's it's going to keep you from pushing up too hard and having that recovery. And having those sort of things of like monitoring you to know that this is going to be better for the future. Um, just like the racing is or the training is better than the racing and then having recovery is better than doing those big days. That's That's really beneficial. And yeah, I'm on the conservative side right now. I trained two days and I got sick. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It's it's, it's our kids in school. John knows. It's so bad. Yeah. The kids are sick. One kid gets sick after another, after another, after another. Yeah. That's how it goes. Well, that's awesome. The aggressiveness slider is huge. Uh, Go check out Red Light, Green Light. If you haven't yet signed up for Trainer Road, this should push you over the edge. It's huge. Uh, It's unprecedented. Nobody's done anything like this. It's really cool. So go check it out, trainerroad.com. Go follow Hannah, um, support Hannah. If you see Hannah at upcoming races, I think, uh, are you doing BWR Utah or what's your next race, Hannah? Um, Sea Otter. Sea Otter. So if you see (laughs) Hannah at Sea Otter, uh, go and send her your support and your love and let her know that you listen to the podcast and everything else. I know there will be a ton of you there at Sea Otter. So exciting stuff. Thanks so much, Hannah. We appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.